was established, uh, I believe, five years ago in 2019. And since then, obviously, uh, we, no we don't have just the plain vanilla ransomware. We have double extortion, triple extortion, and extortion. So it has really morphed into a very sophisticated uh, uh, cyber threat. What do you see as um, over the last uh, five years since OTI site has been established? What do you see? How do, how do you see the conversations kind of evolve into addressing to pay or not to pay? Okay, I, I think this is also a very good question. Um, the standard response and the right thing to do as much as possible is uh, not to pay. Mm. Yeah, and, and I believe uh, most of the regulators out there, whether it's the uh, uh, in, in the States or elsewhere, uh, would discourage uh, paying ransom. But of course, in the news, we still, and the statistics have shown that folks are still paying up ransom. I mean, Colonial Pipeline, they still paid, right? So uh, it, it has become a business decision. If it costs an X amount that is uh, not overly expensive for you to be able to get back your operations because you are losing multiple times that X amount in your operations and just paying a small amount uh, could potentially uh, let you get all the data back and let you uh, um, resume availability of your services. I think it's an attractive option um, for the private operators out there. But they have to bear in mind, I think a lot of, uh, many of these ransomware actors are, are nation state. So you, sometimes you are running afoul of the law if you actually uh, pay the ransom because it is as if you are uh, um, supporting terrorists, abetting uh, criminals. So have to be mindful about that and it's important to have a really good discussion with the legal teams uh, on this aspect. Yeah, Because if you pay the ransom, it also depends on whether your cyber insurance company will pay. There's, there's a lot of uh, um, trickiness in terms of this decision making. Um, predominantly because of a few factors. One, ransom actors, if you pay, there's no guarantee that they're going to provide the decryption tool. And even if they provide a decryption tool because you pay, uh, you are like the hand that never stops giving. So they may come to you again to extort more or they can share this information with other ransomware and gangs. Hey, this is a, a gold mine. Go in. And hey, they have cyber insurance. Yeah, so the, the conundrum about cyber insurance is also hackers, sometimes they attack cyber insurance companies to get hold of the clientele list mm -hmm. so that they can attack the clientele. And they do that because they know these are the folks who have the cyber insurer backing to pay the ransom. You don't want to attack someone who cannot pay, right? So that, that also brings complexity into uh, this question. So triple extortion, uh, if it is, if data hasn't, non-sensitive data has been leaked and if your operations, you have uh, a sound business continuity plan, you have sound disaster recovery and proper backups that you can restore from, uh, then I don't see a good reason to pay because you can recover your operations quickly enough from your backups. And after all, the data that has been leaked out are non-sensitive. Mm. So why run that risk? The yeah. important thing, uh, like you say, is to have a resilient you know, plan, right? To, yes. to have an incident response plan that you have tested and, and uh, s simulated under various scenarios, one of which is including ransomware as well, I guess. Yes, and a crisis management plan as well, uh, which involves uh, uh, top-level discussions because it is not a decision at the incident response uh, um, level, uh, it sometimes goes higher up mm. to the crisis management level where the board may also need to be involved in this discussion um, and, and the legal teams need to be involved as well. So um, the resilience really is about, um, exactly like what mm. we mentioned, uh, having the incident response adequately drilled uh, beyond tabletop, uh, as well as having your business continuity plan uh, 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 tabletop and making sure that it is robust mm. and can sustain a prolonged period of um, digital downtime. Because in an incident, uh, I think earlier, um, 
we had this discussion about uh, hackers, ransomware actors, especially nation state. They are moving from disruption to destruction. And we have seen what happened in Nopetia and so forth, really wiping. No, no amount of ransom is going to get that data back. So having that uh, uh, resilience plan uh, is truly um, what matters because your IT may not work. Your OT may not work. It may take a prolonged period of time for them to uh, come back online. And you need a, a robust business continuity plan to, to sustain your business. Yeah. So how do you see you know, some of the members are adopting AI or leveraging the AI tools in information sharing? Have you seen any sort of interesting you know, use cases that you can share with us? Mm. Now, that's a good question as well. So based on my observation, um, a lot of, uh, quite a number of members are in the journey to explore how generative AI can help in um, OT cybersecurity. Um, that's one. And also how to deploy cybersecurity to protect against uh, adversary AI um, attacks. So why do I say that? It's because AI, in fact, traditional AI has been there for quite a fair amount of time. In fact, even before this hype about uh, chat GPT and open AI, um, some of the cybersecurity products out there were already saying that they have AI between, I mean, IBM Watson and some of the other solutions have already uh, uh, have this for in terms of uh, log monitoring, ingesting logs, in terms of threat hunting, uh, behavior analysis, analytics, whether it's uh, EDRs, uh, UEBAs, or uh, NBAs. Uh, the moment they have behavior analytics, there's an element of uh, AI included. But what really uh, changes deep the scales was uh, generative AI. Because with generative AI, from a security perspective, it can help in terms of um, triage in the triage process to help speed up the analysis. Um, you still need the man, the human, to the man or the woman to, to be involved in uh, checking the, the output uh, in certain cases. So some queries may be more prone to hallucinations, mm -hmm. while others, you can just rely on it without really doing any uh, additional checks. So the triage process in incident response, where you can find out, for instance, you can ask questions like, um, is this a malicious indicator of compromise? Uh, that can be done, mm -hmm. yeah. So it helps to speed up the incident response. And because, why is that important? Because the faster you detect, the faster you can contain. And the faster you can contain, you can disrupt the attacker from moving across the cyber queue chain uh, into your crown jewels. Mm -hmm. So most of the OT attacks are coming from IT. If you can detect, even if an endpoint is compromised, you can detect fast to disrupt the lateral movement of the attacker before it even reaches the gate of your OT network. Mm -hmm. That is uh, 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 winning uh, the, the war itself, right? So, so that helps from a um, adoption of AI in cybersecurity. But I'm also mindful of um, overpromise in terms of uh, Gen AI. And it requires a lot of testing because I do have, I've heard from members who have uh, encountered uh, vendors who have shared that everything is machine speed. Mm -hmm. But again, if you have qualifiers to say that, but you have the but over there that you must check all the output, then how can it be machine speed, right? You, the moment you have human in the loop, it cannot mm -hmm. be machine. So I think we are in the, like the gunner height curve. Uh, we, are, we are in the slight deep into the trial of this illusion because there was a lot of promises and then ultimately we'll stabilize into uh, uh, sustainable, sustainable development and expectation, a full alignment of expectations of what AI can, uh, promises can bring to cybersecurity. And on the adversary AI part, definitely um, incorporating all the uh, required practices into like, for instance, red teaming. Red teaming is no longer just the traditional red teaming. You need red team large language models. Yes. Yeah, you need to perform all the, the prompt injection, manipulation, data poisoning, and so forth. So the, the whole NIAS has to put in place. And security by design also needs to take into consideration. You need to look at OWAPs, uh, top 10 for LM, and make sure that if you are deploying a model, a large language model, uh, you put in all the defenses in place, make sure that you are able to validate the data that goes in, uh, make sure that your 
uh, you are protected against prompt injection and so forth. All those nine yards have to be put in place and the VAPT and red teaming have to come in place to, to validate all these are in place.